Well, it's so good, again, to see everybody. We're in this series called Ephesians from Identity to Destinies. What you believe about yourself shapes who you are. It's so important that we think rightly about ourselves. We have learned neurochemists and neuropsychology have shown us and brain scans that as a person thinks they will become. Of course, the Bible talked about that millennials ago, right? The Bible talks in, in Romans chapter 12, 1 and 2, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The way you think determines the life you live. What you focus upon, what you look at, what you meditate upon, you will become. What you speak, what you do. And so the enemy's job really is to go after that prospect in our lives. Now, today we're going to be talking about, um, about sex, and I wanted to explain to you why we're talking about sex in the Bible. Well, first of all, but before we do that, let me just go ahead and read the Scriptures so you get the context, and then we'll get right into it. Does that sound good, everybody? Okay, let's go ahead and do that. If you want to follow along with me, we're going to look at um, in Ephesians chapter 5. We're going to start with verse 1 all the way to verse 14. Let me go ahead and read it to you. You'll see why I'm talking about what I'm talking about. Here we go. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of God, Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not become partakers with them. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light. Walk as children as light, for the fruit of light is found in all that's good, right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of these things that are done in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore, it says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine upon you. Now, as you can see in that passage of Scripture, it mentions uh, pornea, which is the actual Greek where we get pornography, pornography from, it mentions it several times. Now, why does the Bible talk so much about sex? Let me just go ahead and show you some statistics about pornography, about situations like that. Do you know that almost 80%, according to a bunch of surveys, according to 80% of American men between the ages of 18 and 30 admit to watching porn regularly? Nearly 70% of men between 31 and 49 admit even the last month. Half the men from 50 to senior citizen age also confess of viewing it. 30% of younger men send they watch porn every single day. And this is a 50% of pastors, pastors say they struggle with porn or watched it. So it's an issue. One out of, one out of five women Look at porn as well. But in the area of pornography, as far as written words, it even goes to a higher level. So we can see that pornography is a big thing that's in our culture. In fact, more money comes in from pornography than all of Hollywood movies, more than the NFL, NBA, and NLB combined. About 120 to $150 billion is utilized in that area. Now, are we here to make you feel bad about yourself? No, but this is an issue in our culture. Now, why are we talking about sex? Why are we talking about pornography? Well, all sin separates us from God, okay? But there's something about sexual sin. In 1 Corinthians, it says the following. Every sin is outside the body, but he who sins sexually sins against not the Lord, not your neighbor, but his own body. So when you are involved with sexual immorality, you actually hurt 
yourself. Now, it's quite clear from what we can see in culture, all the venereal diseases, all the problems in, in violence, domestic violence. You can see all the issues going on. It's tremendous the amount of difficulties it has created in our society. And so sex is not a bad thing. God created sex. And why am I talking about this for? Because if you want to damage someone you love, you want to find out what's the most important thing. If you want to win, you want to blow something up, find its vulnerable point and go after it. The enemy understands that sexual immorality is very powerful because not only does it hurt those around people, but it actually hurts a person. More than any other sin, it hurts the person. So as a result of that, it is utilized to bring division to the body of Christ, division between God and people, and creates all kinds of havoc in our society. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, well, you know, come on. The Apostle Paul, he's kind of behind the times. This is 2023, and we've evolved since then. We don't believe in all this fairy tale stuff. It's just no big deal. When you're hungry, you get something to eat. When you feel sexual, you just get sex. It's no big deal. Everyone makes a big deal out of it. No. Actually, there's been studies even from secular humanists that study pornography and lust and all that. It shows you it doesn't work. It actually, there are people that are, are, can't even function in the proper capacity because of pornography, because of a tremendous amount of, of, of sexual problems like that. It creates difficulty. You can see what's happening with diseases. We're not designed for it. Now, someone came to me in the last service and said, Pastor, I don't understand, and I'm glad they brought it up. I'll bring it up to you. Uh, if, if, if the Bible says one man, one woman, which is true, because someone came to Jesus, the Pharisees, and said, hey, is it permissible to divorce a woman for any reason? And they were talking, they're trying to find Jesus in a, in a trap. He says, well, what does the Bible say? He says, the Bible says, right, a man shall leave his father and mother and be and join and cleave to his wife. He shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. That's the way it was in the beginning. So what about polygamy? Well, I know there's polygamy in the Old Testament, but God never ordained polygamy. In fact, you see any passage of Scripture, any times it talks about polygamy, there are problems. Not one time in the Old Testament is it spoken in a positive light. In fact, all the stories, you have to understand something, the narratives of the Bible are actual historical events that also teach object lessons. Every time polygamy is mentioned and talked about, it has devastating results. It's never been God's design. But God works with us and our level of understanding. And Jesus said, I did not come to abolish the law. I've come to fulfill the law. And Jesus made it very clear that sexuality, sex outside of marriage, is not our design. God created sex before one woman and one man in a monogamous marriage for life. That is the protocol. That is what God has designed it for. Now, I understand that we live in a society today where maybe many of you have been a part of issues. I have good news for you, that in Christ, the Bible says, you are a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things are new. Yes, we've all fallen. All of us have fallen short of the glory of God. And so in Jesus Christ, as we mentioned last week, we mentioned last week, that in Jesus Christ, you are children of God and you are new creations. So no matter what your past has been, God wipes it out, and he sees you through Jesus Christ. Remember we mentioned last week that children like to mimic their parents, right? And, and so they, they, they pretend. Well, God pretends that you are Jesus. When he sees you, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, he views you through Jesus Christ. It's through his covering. So the good news is no matter what you've done, God is enough, and that's the good news. All right, that's the really good news, that Jesus is enough. So this is what we're dealing with today. And so today I wanted to look at it today and, and explain to you why is it such an issue. We just mentioned the Bible clearly says it causes more damage to the individual, and now we're seeing that. Now, there's something else very interesting about the body of Christ. In the, uh, in the Roman times, there was a historian that came out and said the following. He says, the church is different than the other society because in the church you have fidelity and monogamy and you have one husband, one wife. They noticed that the, the church had great morality and had good marriages and they stood for that. 
They had strong families. And number two, they were generous to the poor, and they would help those that were struggling. In fact, throughout church history, if there was a plague or something, it was the church that would go in when others ran out of the city. The church ran in. So back in that day, in the history of the church, we see both a, a, both a um, morality and sexuality and helping the poor. Now, what's happened in the last, I would say, about 100 years, something has changed, especially in the last 60 to 70 years. What has happened is the church has kind of split itself. We have the right-wing church, quote-unquote, and we have the left-wing church. Let me explain. In the right wing, we talk a lot about abortion. We talk a lot about sexuality and, and gender and all that kind of thing. We're fighting for that, right? We don't want our kids having these things. We want to believe in the one man, one woman, one lifetime. We talk about that. We talk a lot about that and about the, the rights of the unborn. And we're all about that. And, and we talk about it. Then on the other side of the church, which would be the left or the liberal church, they say, hey, listen, you got to help the poor. They're the downtrodden, the immigrants, and, and their desire is to help them. But your sexuality, eh, no, it doesn't matter. Just take care of the poor. So you, and, then, and then on the right-hand side, on the, liberal, on the conservative side, it's like, hey, have morality, but do whatever you want with your money. Now, I'm showing extremes of both. Both are wrong. God is both. And so we should be going back to our design helping the poor and downtrodden, voluntarily doing that, and standing up for morality. So as you can see, both political parties are off on this. Both of them are off. So don't be a Democrat, a Republican, a right-wing, left-wing. Be a biblical, functioning believer in Jesus Christ, where Christ is our standard and we don't settle for anything else. That's what we're called to do, and that's what we're called to be. Let's be the historical church that we were in the many times. So, We've been talking throughout this whole, whole series that your identity leads to your destiny. We mentioned that the Apostle Paul wrote this book, Ephesians, to a very pagan society. In fact, some people would say that it, there was more sexual immorality in the days of Paul than there is today. In fact, Plato, not the Plato stuff you play with, but Plato, the, uh, the, the philosopher thought it said this. Basically, it's okay to have sex with whoever you want to have sex with as long as you take care of the home. And that was very common back then. Back in those days, in the time of the Apostle Paul and the, uh, in the Roman government and the Roman providences, you could get a glass of wine, quote unquote, for five bucks, and you could you could also get a prostitute for five bucks. It was very common uh, for prostitution, all kinds of sexual stuff was going on, and people thought it was uh, old fashioned, if you will. It was it was unrealistic for anything else but that. You could do whatever you wanted to do, but the Apostle Paul said no, and the scriptures say no. So this is not something that is way past. No, the Apostle Paul. And the Bible was dealing with a more permissive society that was dealing with all kinds of problems, more than we even have today. So when he says this, this is pretty amazing. And so I want to talk to you today about how do you live in sexual purity? How do you live in sexual purity? And here's the first point today. Number one, you ready? Write this down if you're not writing it down. Adopt God's standards. Adopt God's standards. And Ephesians 5, 3 says this, but sexual immorality and all impurity. In the, NIV, in the NIV, it says this, but among you there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality or any kind of impurity or greed because these are improper for God's holy people. So why is it improper for God's holy people? Because God uses marriage and sexuality to explain his relationship with Israel and God, he used to say, you are an adulterer. You're running out on me. Then in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul, which we'll talk about later, that we are the bride of Christ, and Christ is the groom, and we're going to be married. We're going to consummate. It actually uses that word. Oh, that's kind of gross, Pastor. Why are you talking? Listen, I, I don't want to talk about this either. It's in the Bible. I'm not suggesting for a moment we're going to have some kind of a weird sexual experience. No, it's not about that. What the Bible is talking about is the closest intimacy 
possible, in, humanly speaking, God is going to be closer than that. For example, you have a mother. It talks about God in maternal ways. He'll hide you under his wings. And so that Christ is our groom, and we are the bride of Christ, and one day we're going to be together. You see, in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve were naked and unafraid. They were naked before God and unafraid, but when sin came in, it came accusation and hiding and blaming. Hiding, accusation, and blaming. And this is what began to happen. So sex in God, what he talks about, it is an intimacy that God brings together as I mentioned before, it's created for a husband and wife only. Now, if you are struggling with this area, I want to encourage you to make it right. Studies have shown this, and this is not from Christian people. Studies have undeniably shown that people who cohabitate before they get married have a higher rate of divorce than those that wait until they get married. Now, if you're cohabitating, we're happy to help you. We want to make, help you get under God's blessing. God's not upset with you that you're having fun. God's upset that you're hurting yourself and each other. You see, God's design is works. Now, imagine, if you will, imagine, if you will, uh, that we went to an art gallery, and we have a Mona Lisa. Now, it's priceless. It's like 100 million bucks or something like that. All right? So you have the Mona Lisa. And imagine someone says, hey, take the Mona Lisa. Just go ahead and put it down here in the lobby area. People can look at it. No big deal. It's no big deal. What would happen if you were to do that? You can't do that. That's art, right? That's precious art. Do you realize that you're precious before the Lord? And he doesn't want you to be abused and misused. The painting that you are to God, you are a piece of work in the good sense. You are created in God's image. God loves you. You're beautiful. You are God's poem, as it says. You are God's, you're created for good works in Christ Jesus. So you wouldn't do that to an art, art piece, would you? No. You would treat it with great reverence and respect. And so why God does that with us is he cares about us. He's not against our fun. He wants you to have the utmost of fun in its proper context. So that's what it's all about. So it's very interesting that God talks about that. Now, in Matthew 5, 27, Jesus brings it to the heart level. He says, you've been heard that you shall not commit adultery. But I said, he who looks lustfully at a woman has already committed adultery in his heart. Now, I used to think, well, since I already thought it, I might as well do it. No, 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 that's not what he's saying. He's saying that it comes here. So as it is in your heart, you will become. So he's dealing with our hearts. And also in this passage, how you talk, and see, it's heart, it's how you talk until it gets to your hands. So the first key is this, is to accept God's standards. The second point is this, avoid the deadly deception. There is a deadly deception out there. Now, the problem with being deceived is this. I heard one, some, someone said this a number of years ago. I never forgot it. They said, I'm not deceived. I'm like, well, if if you knew you were deceived, you would not be deceived. The fact that you're deceived, <laughs> you see that, everybody? You're not aware. It says, do not be deceived. In Ephesians 3, 5. It says in Ephesians 3, 5 through, uh, 3 through 5, but the sexual immorality and all impurity or all covetousness might not even be named among, uh, among you as property of the saints. Let there be no filthiness or foolish talk, or crude joking. Okay, there goes the entire comedians out there, right? Do we not do that? Filthiness, nor foolish talk, or, or crude joking, or uh, entendres. Oh, she's my work wife. Right, honey? No, no, you, you, no don't, don't be playing games with that. Don't be, it's, it's inappropriate to do that with another person that's not your wife if you're married, right? Don't even joke about that, or foolish talk. See, this is the problem. If you can joke about it, it's easier to do it. When I go to the dentist, I don't like going to the dentist, but when I go to the dentist, I avoid it. I, went, I didn't go for two years. Don't tell anybody. And I went to the dentist. I said, oh, we're going to have to take it, give you some Novocaine. Oh, no. And he comes in with this, I hate needles. That's why I never get a tattoo. I don't like needles. So anyhow, he comes in. Come here. I open up. I'm like, oh, gosh. And I'm, ah, you know, the thing's sucking all the things out of my mouth. I'm, I'm supposed to keep my mouth open. He's asking me questions. I can't even talk. Oh, you know. And all of a sudden, he gets his needle, and he puts it in my gum. And I'm like, oh, he said, are you okay? I said, well, why do you think I'm squirming? Duh. 
You know, obviously I'm not doing okay, and he puts the needle in my gum, and then when he puts the Novocaine, whatever it is, I feel it's like burning in my face, and I feel like I'm going to die. And then after about five to seven minutes, it's like, oh, it's like my face just melted off. Right? I'm like, well, this is pretty good chewing gum. That's not chewing gum. That's your tongue. Stop biting. So what Novocaine does is it numbs you so they can do the work in your mouth. Humor is like Novocaine. It numbs you from God's truth. It's careful. I mean, Novocaine can be used in a good way, but a bad way as well. And so if we can laugh at sexual jokes, laugh at innuendos and all that type of thing, what happens is it lowers the threshold of our ability to care anymore. And what entertains you trains you. So you're sitting there and you're watching something. Would you have someone, would you have naked people in your living room? But we're sitting there watching something on television, and, and, and what it's doing is lowering the threshold. And all of a sudden, what happens is you, you're not afraid of sin anymore. It doesn't bother you. You get used to it. I, I don't want to be rude or crude or anything, but this is a garbage dump. If you live in a garbage dump, you don't smell it anymore. And you can't even discern it anymore. So it's important we understand that. So, but all sexual immorality, all impurity, and foolish talking, nor crude joking. So how you speak is also important. As a man thinks and a man he speaks. You see, if the enemy can get us to speak the wrong thoughts and wrong things, what happens is mouth, your mouth has power. What you speak, you drive towards, whether it's a lie or true. So you start talking about stuff. I'm just joking. Now, if you're just joking, how many of you would go to the airport? And, the S, uh, and you're sitting there going through security check. I got a bomb in my pocket. <laughs> See what happens. Go ahead. Try. What's in that bag? Oh, I got C4 explosive. <laughs> See what happens. Do you have a gun? Oh, yeah, I carry a gun. Now, you would never joke that. You can't even joke that. Well, they'll arrest you. Why? Because it's that serious. If you joke about it, it could be a problem, right? But why do we joke about something that can destroy our marriages? Destroy? You shouldn't even joke about it. Why? we got to take it seriously, everybody. Oh, you can't even have fun. No, I'm not suggesting that, everybody. I'm not get, let's not get legalistic about it. Remember, this is not about being legalistic. You're not good enough, and I'm not good enough. We can never be good enough. But we are children of, of Almighty God. And why do I want to lower my standards by joking about something like that? So we have to understand that. We have to have our hearts our, and our hands as well. And in verse 5, it says this. For you can be sure of this, that everyone is sexual immoral or impure or who covets, that is the idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ. Let me read that again. For you may be sure of this, that everyone, now who's everyone? Everyone's everyone. Who is sexually immoral or impure. Or covetous. What's covetous? I want more. I can never be enough. You see, what happens is with pornography or any kind of things that are not good for you, you eat it and you want more. It doesn't satisfy. You want more. In fact, I heard a story a number of years ago about how people in the northern parts of the, they used to call them Eskimos, but we can't say that anymore. So uh, the people that live in the Arctic Circle, if they want to kill a, a polar bear, what they'll do is they'll get a spike, a razor spike, and they'll put herring, which is fish, and they'll freeze it and put more on it. And so a polar bear will come at night and smell it, and the polar bear begins to lick the blade. As it licks the blade, it cuts their tongue, and the, the warmth of the blood melts the ice, and it tastes more and more of the herring. And it keeps licking feverishly until the polar bear is dead the following day. That's what sin will do to you. When it's not godly, you'll want more and receive less. It's just like it is with drugs. That's what will happen. So the Bible says in verse 5, for you can be sure of this. When the Bible says you can be sure of this, is don't be deceived, right? Everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or is covetous, that's an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. It isn't like God, oh my gosh, they're having fun. Stop them from having fun. No, God see us, sees us hurting each other. He sees kids. He sees the sex trafficking that's going on. Over 2 million children are sex trafficked in our world. And the highest consumer of child pornography is the United States of America. So all this is like licking that spike. It's not satisfying anymore. You want more and more and more twisted. 
And so you have no inheritance. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because these things, the wrath of God comes upon us. Why? Because God does not like to see bad things happen to people. He loves you and loves me and loves society, and he wants to give us a chance to make it right. He's not against it. He wants you to have the best love you can. In fact, I'm going to embarrass myself a little bit and embarrass my parents. My dad just turned 88. My parents are going to be married 64 years at 29th of this month. Amen? Yeah. And uh, this kind of grosses me out and make, gives me hope at the same time. We have the best sex life now than we've ever had. I'm like, should I smile or should I throw up? I don't know which one. <laughs> and what they mean by that is they're closer now. They love each other more now than they ever have. They, they have nothing between them. They have a lifehood, lifetime of life together. They love each other, and they've grown. And by the way, they had a very bad marriage almost at the point of divorce. But God healed their marriage. That's for someone today. God can heal your marriage. And I'm praying that one day you'll look in your spouse's eyes, 60, 70 years uh, young, saying We're, we can do this. And so this is what can happen. No, no one deceive you. Wrath comes upon disobedience. No inheritance. You know what it means to have no inheritance? Let me read that again. For be sure of this, that everyone who is sexual immoral or impure or is covetous, that's an adulterer, has no inheritance. Now, if you have a rich uncle, we all, we all pray that we have a rich uncle that we didn't know, not know about. And somehow or another, this rich uncle put you in his will. If you get a call on the telephone saying, hello, this is me, our rich uncle, it is, it is a scam, okay? I've had people from Nigeria trying to tell me that if they'll give me my routing number, I can hold on to $20,000 to give me five. Okay, don't buy it, okay? I learned the hard way. No, I'm just kidding. That didn't happen. But what, what can happen is there's no inheritance. So if, if you, go to, you go to the executive of this, this estate, there's a court proceeding, and you're excited, I'm going to get an inheritance, and they go, I'm sorry, you have no inheritance. What does that mean? When I say you have no inheritance, you have what? No inheritance. In other words, you don't get anything of that inheritance. So when the Bible says that anyone who d- does these types of things has no inheritance, it means they have no inheritance in the kingdom of heaven. What is the ramifications of having no inheritance in the kingdom of heaven? That means the kingdom of heaven is not yours. Is that hell? Uh, it sounds like hell to me. What do you mean? If I, I looked at porn, I'm going to hell. If I get in a car accident? No, that's not what we're talking about. If you say, I don't care what the word of God says, I'm going to do it my way, and I, the hell with you. I'm doing what I want. If you do that, What's happening is this. I wonder if you're even a Christian in the first place. Christian in name only. Crino. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Okay. Christian in name only. I, I say I love Jesus, but you know what? I'm doing my own thing. Right? I mean, think about this. How would you like this when you get married one day? If you get married. You get before the, the actually, and you give your vows. And all of a sudden, your, your spouse says to you, uh, to have and to hold, to have and to hold until I find someone else more attractive. Would you want to marry that person? Of course not. God is even more. He, he offers you everything. And what he asks you is everything. He loves you. He wants nothing in between us. So you have no inheritance. Let no one deceive you from that. No inheritance. In fact, it says, I'm going to show you, it's not just a cherry-picked verse. In 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11 says the following. Or do you not know the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexual immoral, nor the idolaters, nor the adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor the drunkards, nor the revilers, nor the swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Now, that's pretty much all of us fall on that list somehow. Here's the good news. And such were some of you, but you were washed. You were sanctified. 
you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. This is the truth of the matter. I am a child of God. I am a new creation created in Christ Jesus. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. God is not trying to make you a better person. God is trying to get the dead in you to come alive in him. This is the answer for we have. Galatians 6 says, 6 7 through 9 says this, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that he will reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption, and the one who sows from the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. And let us not grow weary and well-doing, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So, back to Ephesians 5. Let no one deceive you with empty words. Verse 7, therefore, do not be partakers with them. Who? Let me read back in the context. Let no one deceive you, verse 6 of Ephesians 5. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. So don't be an SOD. Sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. Don't hang out with people who are going the wrong way, lest you become like them. This is written to the church, not those outside the church. So if you have a brother that is swindling, a brother that is materialistic, a brother that is involved with all sorts of situations, you go to the house, you want to get a, you want to watch a Yankee game, but boy, I tell you what, the Yankees are doing terrible. They lost seven in a row, but I mentioned that. And he's sitting there, and he's having, a, he's having a drink, and he has another drink, and another drink, and he's getting drunk. You keep hanging out people are getting drunk. Pretty soon, you'll be getting drunk. You hang out with somebody that's going through a divorce and you hang around all people that are marriages are, tra- are going through a hard time. Guess what's going to happen to you? Divorce is a communicable disease. Sin is a communicable disease. You become who you hang out with. That's why the Bible says do not even be our partners with them. Talk to your friend. Hey, listen, brother, I love you, but the way you're treating your spouse, I, don't want, I cannot endorse what you're doing. I cannot endorse the lifestyle you're doing. What you're doing is wrong. You need to get right before God. Listen, I got my own problems, and the Bible says I should be careful lest I fall. But let me tell you right now what you're doing is wrong, and I'm going to have to disassociate myself with you. That, that's a loving thing to do. That's a loving thing to do. So sometimes you're supposed to cut off relationships with people that are going the wrong way. Hopefully, they'll wake up. You don't do it in a pontifical way. Well, I'm better than you. No. If not by the grace of God, none of us could stand. All of us have fallen short of the glory of God. There's not one that's righteous, no, not one. So therefore, do not be partakers with them. For at one time, you were darkness. In verse 8, verse, uh, Ephesians uh, 5, 8. For at one time, you were darkness. But now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the I'm a child of God. I may struggle with sins, but I am not a sinner. Uh, let me explain something very clearly. It's very important that you understand this. Your identity determines your destiny. So I know it's popular that if you're an Alcoholics Anonymous or something like that, you go, hi, my name is Eric, and I'm a drunk. But I haven't had a drink, and I'm an alcoholic. I haven't had a drink in 22 years, but I'm an alcoholic. No, I'm not. You see, it's good to confess your sins. Your sin does not define you. Your Savior does. So what I would say is this. Yeah, I'm an alcoholic. I'm not an alcoholic, by the way. Okay. My name is Eric. I'm a child of God, and I'm overcoming the desire to drink alcohol. My name is Eric. I'm a child of God. And I'm choosing sexual purity. My name is Eric, and I'm a child of God. I'm learning to be good to people, forgive people. So what you say, I'm a child. My identity is wrapped up in Christ, not my sin. My sin is not defined me. My Savior does. You need to get that in your head, everybody. So what you say is, I am a child of God. I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus. I am a son of God, and I don't have to live by this. The Bible says you're under no obligation to live in the, live in the flesh. So, I choose to be pure. Now, if someone says, imagine, imagine this. You pull over the side of the road, and, uh, and a cop pulls you over, and you go, hey, uh, you were speeding. I know. I, I, I'm a speeder. What do you mean? That's my identity. I'm a speeder by nature. I came out of my womb, and I cannot help but go 20 miles over the speed limit. 
You were going 80 in the industrial park in Cheshire. I understand that, officer. But I cannot help myself. That's my identity. And you're being hateful to pull me over. I'm a speeder. And I have an identity. That's why I have these race checkered flag tattoo on my neck. I cannot help myself. That's ridiculous, right? Or how about this? It's tax day. And, and you don't pay your taxes. And the IRS comes to you and says, where, where, where are your taxes? I don't have to pay taxes. Why? I'm tax free. What do you mean? That's my identity. I'm tax free. I was born tax free. I cannot help but be tax free. That's why I'm cutting off all that the IRS taxes because I'm tax free. Right? I mean, how ridiculous is that? But that's what we do. But instead, we are a child of God. We're different than that. Our identity is wrapped up in who we are in God. So what we want to be able to do is we don't try to change. We change. Let me explain something here. Okay, first one is this. God is our standard, right? The first thing is this. Adopt God's standards. Number two, do not be deceived. And here's number three. Remember who you are. I'm a child of God. I may struggle with these situations but I am a child of God. I like to say, I'm a child of God, and I'm becoming more like Christ. You remember who you are. And the Bible says, if anything becomes visible, is light. Therefore, awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine upon you. That's actually a hymn that the Apostle Paul is talking in the early church. He used to sing that. Arise from the dead. You need to wake, O sleeper. You are a child of God. Awaken to the truth. And so what we want to do, so we want to walk together in the light. So the Bible says, read in verse 7, Therefore do not be partakers with them, for at one time you were darkness, but now you are light. Walk as children as light. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore, it says, awake, O sleeper. So we want to walk in the light as he's in the light. That's what we want to do. We want to turn the light on in our lives. My my identity is in Christ. So don't say, I'll try not to. Can you imagine? Can you imagine if if, if someone says to you, the police officer pulls you over? You go, okay, officer, I'll try not to speed again. I'll try. Will you come to work tomorrow? Tell your boss. I'll try to come to work on time. Would you, is that good, try? No, you don't try, you do. You say, I am. I am a child. I want to say, I'll try. I'll try to be good. No, I am good. My identity is wrapped up. You see, whatever you think about, whatever you focus upon, you will drive towards. Now, you take that from the natural standpoint of your neurochemistry, and you, you marry that with the spirit of the Holy Spirit, you have an incredible force where your identity is wrapped up. So what I try to do is I am a child, God. I am pure. I am holy. I have self-control. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And no temptation has overtaken me but what is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not allow me to be tempted beyond what I can stand. But with every temptation, he'll provide an avenue of escape, 1 Corinthians 10, 14. You need to speak the truth. I am. I don't try, I am. It says in 1 Yoda 3.17. Do not try, do. Okay? <laughs> By the way, who's Yoda? Uh, never mind. It's not in the Bible. Okay. But seriously, don't try, do. I am a child of God. I am chosen by him. I am a new creation in Christ Jesus. I'm adopted in the beloved. I thank you, God, that you see me as you see through Jesus. But what you have to do is you have to be willing. Now, what happens if you're struggling with sin? Listen, I understand we all struggle with various things. But stop making excuses. Take ownership. And here's just how we change. First, first John 5, 9, as we're getting ready to end here. First John 5, I'm sorry, 1 John 1, 5 through 9 says this. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. So if there's any darkness in your life, get it out into the light. If we say we have fellowship with him, while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. If you're struggling with pornography, if you're struggling with idolatry, 
If you're struggling in a flirtatious relationship, if you are right now seeing someone and no one knows what's going on, if you're, if you're involved with something, take ownership of it. So admit you're wrong. Confess it to God. And then find a brother or sister who you can trust that loves Christ and confess it to them. The Bible says, confess your sins to one another. Pray for one another and confess your sins to each other that you may be healed. It takes the body to be the body. You're not called to do this all by yourself. We need each other, everybody. Yes, Christ forgives us. No question about that. But healing often comes in the body. We want Cornerstone to be a safe place for you. If you're struggling with anything at all, we're not here to condemn anybody. We're here to help you. If not by the grace of God, I could be anything in the world. When I recognize that I could be a murderer, I could be a thief, I could be an adulterer, how can you say that? Because I know what I am without God. And when you recognize who you are with God, without God and recognize who you are with God, there's grace and there's hope. I'm going to ask at the keyboarders or someone. We can, oh, there you go. Good to see you. I guess I need to put the thing, unmute it if you could. Okay. You all know you cannot close a service without a keyboard. So when you start hearing keyboard sounds in the air, you know Christ is coming back. Okay. I don't know the trumpet or sign of the keyboard will play. But uh, I lost my train of thought. But uh, if we say we have fellowship with the darkness and we lie and practice not the truth, but if we walk in the light as he's in the light, we have fellowship with one another. As we walk in the light, there's nothing, there's no secrets in my life. Live your life as if there's no such thing as a secret. Maybe you're going through something. Maybe you have a marriage or, or your relationship is going the wrong way. You need to find someone you can confide in. You've got to get rid of the darkness. You're as only as healthy as your secrets. Let's live a life full of integrity. And listen, everybody, if you desire to get right with God, God's already working on you. I don't care if you committed adultery last night. God can forgive you today. He loves you. And so you're not going to hell. If you, if you say, I don't care what God says, I'm doing it my own way, you're in danger. But if you have a, a, a tug back to God, you need to get right with God. Today is the day. And not just with sexual sin, all kinds of sin. Anytime you say, I'm in charge and God's not, you are sinning. So verse 7, but if we walk in the light as he's in the light, we have a fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us all. Cleanses us from what? All sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth's not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all on righteousness. You don't have to live that way. I heard a story from Matt Chandler, one of my, I happen to like, he's a good pastor in the Nashville area. He told a story of how he was a young adult and there was this young lady he was trying to help come to know Christ and she lived a pretty promiscuous background. And he brought her to this, this youth event and the pastor that began had a beautiful rose in his hand. It was beautiful. He says, I'm going to pass it to you. Just pass this around through the, through the time of my talk. So he, he preaches about sexual purity. And at the very end, he says, yeah, that rose back. He came to rose back. That rose was handled by a bunch of people. And as a result, its petals were falling off. It was bent. It was broken. He goes, when you were sleeping with a bunch of people, this is what you want to give your spouse one day. Who would want this? And Matt said he got so angry. He said, I'll tell you who wants that. Jesus wants that rose. So you may be broken. You've made, made a lot of mistakes. But Christ can wash you, cleanse you, and make you as white as the snow. Remember, your sin does not define you. Your Savior does. So godly sorrow leads to repentance. Worldly sorrow leads to death. Worldly sorrow, you run and hide. Godly sorrow, you take ownership and you give it to God and you get free. I ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. Lord Jesus, Father, I don't stand here above anyone else. If not by your grace, I could not stand. Lord, all of us are prone to the old man in our lives. But Father, we thank you that in, in you, Jesus, we are a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things are new. Lord, thank you. In Christ, I am chosen. I am forgiven. 
I am loved. I'm, I'm healed in Jesus' name. Father, thank you that in you we are your children. Thank you, Father, that in Jesus Christ you see us as if we never sin. Although our sins are scarlet red, you will make them white as snow. We thank you. It's not by any other way, by us surrendering our lives to you and saying yes to you in Jesus' name. Father, I pray for anyone here right now in the sound of my voice, Lord, if anyone's struggling with greed, unforgiveness, pride, materialism, sexual misconduct, adultery, pornography, living a homosexual lifestyle, living a adulterous lifestyle, living a lifestyle of fornication, anything without the confines of your design. Lord Jesus, we choose this day to say no to sin and say yes to Christ. Thank you, Jesus, that we're under no obligation to obey the fleshly, that we are no obligation. We are children of you, and we declare that we have the character of Jesus Christ. Father, we want to become more like you. I pray you make us holy and clean through the blood of Jesus right now. I break off of shame right now. There's no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. Just take a moment right now and think of some areas of your life. Maybe some of you need to, to get help. And if that's you here today, we want to encourage you. You're welcome to contact us in Fort Cornerstone Church. You want to make a, 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 an appointment to see one of us. We, we want to help you. Listen, I'm here to help. I'm not here to condemn anybody. I was been rescued. I want to see you rescued. You don't have to go to alone. We want to help you. Whatever you're going through, we want to help you because God loves you. And we want to let you know there are better days ahead.